Welcome to Senior Flicks. My name is Ron, and I'm excited today because I get to introduce you to a friend of mine, David Kennedy. And David has been a friend for a number of years, but he's also supported me and helped me in my grief journeys throughout life, and uh, more in particular the latter part. Uh, he's worked with as a grief counselor, and he'll be sharing with us a little bit more about that. But David, in our culture, it's really difficult to talk about death and dying. We avoid it at all costs, uh, to our detriment. And I'd like you to share with us a little bit about maybe why we do that, and then what, what happens and why is it important for us to, uh, to face our own mortality. Thanks, Ron, and, and again, thank you for the privilege of being here with you, and, and this is uh, uh, something I really look forward to, just to have our conversations. Right. Um, but yeah, as you said, I, I worked for a number of years in grief counseling and moved to hospice about 15 years ago. Right. And for 10 years at hospice, I worked in uh, developing their grief and bereavement programming for adults and children and teens around right. grief. And then the last uh, number of years, I um, went into the palliative side of things, right. did some more training, more education, and spent the last number of years working in right. a, a palliative community right. team with physicians yeah. and nurses and so, uh, so, working with people yeah. who have been diagnosed yeah. with a life-threatening illness. Okay, so a lot of people might not understand what the term palliative mm -hmm. means. Good. Can you share that Good. with us and, a little bit? And, I, and thank you, because that is a very important term. So often I would say to somebody, uh, you know, talk about their palliative, and they'd, they'd get all excited, because <laughs> I didn't know I was, I, I was palliative. And right. I said, well, the truth is we all are, actually. Right. Um, palliative is doesn't mean that you're dying tomorrow. Hmm. Palliative simply means that you have been diagnosed with a life-threatening illness, okay. that, that you have something going on in you that is going to shorten your life mm, more than you had thought. Right. So palliative, um, it, it needs to be understood that I've had palliative patients that I've worked with for three years okay. or four years. Right. So it doesn't mean you're dying tomorrow, right. but it does mean that you have a life-threatening illness that right. is going to eventually end your life. Right. Um, so working in that field, what we talked about the, a great deal of the time, at least to begin with, mm. um, was death. And right. you're absolutely right, Ron, that, that as a culture, we do not talk about death. We don't use that word very right. often. We talk about people passing away. We talk have all the euphemisms right. for those things. Right. Um, but we very rarely talk about death and very rarely face our own dying, mm -hmm. um, which, as you so right. Uh, rightly said, is to our detriment. So our culture, um, you know, has gone through this this phase of what we have called a death denying culture, right. which describes that in inability or unwillingness to talk about that and to live right. as if it's not going to happen right. to me. And part of that happened, yeah. uh, we, always, we weren't always like that. No, right. <laughs> uh, and, and what happened to change that was right. probably medicine. And oh, okay. the last 100, oh, 120 right. years since the right. 1900s, um, death, and grief have been medicalized a great deal. For instance, when I talk to people, when I initially talk to people who are palliative in my first connection, um, I would ask them, where, if you have a choice, where would you like to die? Hmm. 90, 90, 95% of them say, I'd like to die at home. Right, right. Now, a hundred years ago, <laughs> two hundred years ago, that's exactly where they would have died. Right. They wouldn't have had the option. They wouldn't right? have had the option. Right. The truth is now it's about 89 percent right. or almost 90 percent of people die in an institution. So okay. that's either hospital, long-term care, right. uh, some, some type of facility right. uh, institutionalized. Right. So the number of people who actually do die at home is fairly rare. Um, Talk to us a little bit, and, and I, I don't mean to interrupt your no, no, train of good. thought, 
but the uh, the hospice mm. hospice mm. is is different mm -hmm. than dying in a long term care. Right. It's different from what I understand in terms of uh, obviously a hospital, right? And uh, and different than being right. at home. Although you can have hospice care at home, exactly. Uh, <clears throat> what is the benefit of a hospice? And from mm -hmm. my understanding, there aren't enough of right. them. Right. Would that be accurate to That's say? That's very accurate. So a hospice, the goal of hospice, and Cicely Saunders is the founder of this in, in England um, over about 130 years ago. Right. Um, it has been active in Canada, and, and I speak for the Peterborough area. It has been part of our community for about 40 years. And hospice really focuses on home-like care. So right. for people right. who cannot be at home to die, right. hospice often, and, and unfortunately it's only been recently where we have been able to provide beds. Right. So three years ago we, we built a 10-bed facility in Peterborough. Prior to that we worked, we were in the homes and help people die at okay. home if possible. Right. But a hospice now who, that has a care center to it, um, they will likely have five, six, or ten beds. There's a few of them in the Toronto area that are larger, but not many. Right. And the and the reason for that is we don't want it to feel like an institution. Right. So right. it's not. If it gets big, then it feels mm. like institutionalized. So a hospice, right. <clears throat> in our case, ten beds, each room. We encourage families when they come in. This is, this is your home. You can right. bring whatever you want from home. Right. Put right. it in your room. Right. If you have a pet that that's important to you, oh, nice. <clears throat> the pet nice. can be with you as long as it has its shots and sure. things. Nice. Um, but the goal of hospice care is to make it as much like home as possible right. without medical interventions. Mm. We have full-time RNs, RPNs, right. a palliative doctors, physicians, a support team that looks after you. Right. Uh, so you don't have to worry about the medical side. Right. Your family can be there 24-7. Right. We have beds that people, yep. family members yeah. can sleep on. Um, and so it's it's an engagement. They, they have... Huh. You know, it, sometimes I go into that prior to COVID. Right. Sometimes I'd walk in there and it'd be like, oh, there's a party going on. They're yes, celebrating yes, a yeah. birthday here <laughs> and they've got cake and they're singing and right. they've, they've got this person down. Right. Um, and so it's really an attempt to make life yeah. as best we can quality wise right. until the very end of life. I had a couple of friends fairly recently and you are familiar with both of them who were well, they were dealing with cancer, and uh, uh, and and it was an extended period of time for each of them, and they both died with hospice care, but they both died yeah. differently. Right. And uh, um, one, uh, when he realized it was coming near the end, said, "I want to be in a hospice outside of the home." Right. Uh, and the purpose for that was. I don't want my right. family to have any right. burden right. other than the relationship that we have right. and the time that we have together in these final final days, years, whatever. You, mostly I think it's months or days, yes. right? Yes. And yeah. weeks in that yeah. setting. And there's probably not enough of them across the province from what I understand. Uh, and, and I visited there, and you're right. There was that party atmosphere there was that um, that family gathering yes. without yeah. responsibility yeah. you, know, you want cookies they were down at the end of the hall right, right. right? I I'm yeah. a cookie man I like the cookies and the, and the chocolate milk and so all that stuff is there just supplied yep volunteers caring yeah. for you the other one was in in the home <laughs> and very um, an additional amount of uh, burden on the family, I would say, and right. I'm not sure "burden" is the right word. No, it's a good word um, because they share a responsibility there, right. and uh, but the hospice <clears throat> comes in. Still, I think much better than in the hospital. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I think you know I try to say to people um, if, who want to stay at home, we can provide 
as much services as possible. Right. There may be reasons why you have to go to the hospital. Right. So sometimes in death, yes. as we, you know, death is very rarely what we see on television in this romanticized. Right. Death can be very difficult. Right. And it can be hard on family. Yeah. It, it takes a lot of care. Right. A lot of care. Right. And it, a lot of caregiver burnout. So right. all of the, and again, the, the, the government is, <laughs> doesn't fund enough, unfortunately. Right. right. Um, I can only speak for the Peterborough <clears throat> area. We have incredible palliative physicians right. who are on call 24-7. Right. We have nurses that go in 24-7. But right. we, you, can't, you can't have care 24-7. Right. PSWs, nurses, they come, they spend time. But then they leave, and right. family members have, as you say, have right. to take up that that slack. Right. So it can be very difficult on mm. family. Um, however, it is yeah. something that that we can, right. as best as possible, accommodate. Right. But it takes a lot of, you know, there's a great um, line that says, right, it takes a village to raise a child. Right. It takes a village to help people die well, and uh, that's the way uh, death yes, was yeah. in my grandparents and my great grandparents' right. time. Right. It really was something that family, yeah. extended family, neighbors, right. all participated in. Right. And when, when death and medicine in, came and took over those things, right. um, <clears throat> They, they, it, it, it automatically went to the hospital. You went there to die. Right. Um, I, I was giving a, um, uh, a grand rounds at, at the hospital a number of years ago, and I started with the fact that, <laughs> um, you know, when I was born and when you were born, right. uh, you know, it was in the hospital, and you know, my dad would be sitting out with all the other ones and right. mom, mom was in having me and then you know dad would be allowed to go down and look through the window and right. and then he went home and we stayed in the hospital for five days and then right. we went home right, right. Uh, and and birth now is something that is you know taken out of the medical realm right. to a great extent to right. where a lot of births at home right. um, if it's in the hospital the father's there the grandparents right. everybody but the janitors in on this <laughs> right. right watching right. this piece right. and so birth we've able to take away from that a right. little bit right but death has been slower right and so we still kind of move people out of the right. way when it comes right. to death when death and so that contributes to our cultures not wanting to talk about death. Right. Um, I think, interestingly enough, I use the term death denying culture. Right. Uh, what I see a lot of in the, in the, and I don't have the designation of generations down yet, right. but whatever this new generation and the one right. you know, who are 19, 20, 25, um, I, I think to a great extent they're almost a death defying culture. Mm. This extreme sports where they, they you know, ah. they're living on the edge of death all the time. Right. And they do it, they make that a choice. Right. It's almost like a death defying. Right. But but we you know, we, we grew up in a death denying nobody yes. talked about nobody death. Talked. You didn't talk about it. No, you weren't and, and you weren't so, encouraged to and that's to our detriment because yeah. we're all going there. Right. I've come, you know, when I, one of the first things I would say to, to, um, to families, right. not so much the person who's dying, because they get it, right, but right. families who don't want to talk about right. it, I would say, you know, when you avoid something, you invest it with a great deal of power. Mm. And if you avoid yeah. it, that power resides in that, that you don't want to talk about. Right, right. If we can talk about it, and, and really explore it, right. it still has some power, but it right. divests of much of its danger. Right. So I really encourage early on yeah. to say, okay, let's, let's have a conversation about death and right. dying. Yes. Yeah. And let's, let's have the conversation so that we, we've had the conversation. Right. We don't have to be doing it in the crisis right. Of, right. of death. We can do it now. Yeah. And what that includes are things, there's three questions right. I usually ask the person who's dying, yes. <laughs> I will say, what do you think it's like to die? Mm. What do you think that's going to be like, that moment? Right. right. What, do you, what do you think it might be like? I okay. mean, none of us have done it. No. So right. I don't know. No. I don't, right. And I, yes. I kind yeah. of joke with them and say, right. you know, you're, you're the expert. I don't know. Right. But you're closer to it right. than I am, right. maybe. Right. So what do you think it's going to be like? Yeah. And, or what do you hope it might be like? So okay. what do you hope for right. at death? Most people... Most people will respond like, I hope it's, I hope it's peaceful. Yeah. Yeah. I hope it's without pain. Right. 
Uh, I hope I have people yeah. around me that I love. Yeah. Uh, and but it's important to identify that, right? So those questions allow them to to to, to do that, right? They allow them to process what they've never probably processed before. Right. So so that's the and first. Give them one. permission. Yeah. What do you think it's going to be like when you die? Right. Right. The second one, and I have a story about that. <laughs> Uh, I'll tell it, because okay. yeah. otherwise yeah. I'll forget it. Right, at my right. Age. Yeah. So before we had a residential hospice, I worked in the palliative unit at the hospital, mm -hmm. too. I used to see a lot of people there. Right. And I remember this woman, she was in her, in her, she wasn't that old, she was in the late 50s. Right. And she had lived a very difficult life, and right. uh, she was on her own, mm. and she was a little, you know, sometimes the staff found her a little funny, uh -huh. um, but I loved visiting her. Right. So I, we had this, she was terrified of her dying. And right. I said to her, I'll say, um, I'll say Janet, that's not mm. her name, but right. I say, Janet, you know, um, you know, what do you, what do you hope for, you know, when you die? And she said, well, I'd like to just close my eyes, go to sleep and wake up dead, which, <laughs> which is an oxymoron, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But right. anyway, I said, well, well, I can't <laughs> promise that, but why don't we, right. let's hope for that. Let's right. hope you just, Close right. your eyes, go to sleep, and that's it. I right. said, um, do you want to practice? <laughs> she said, sure. So she well, laid there like this and closed her yeah. eyes. Yeah. And all of 10 seconds. Right. And then her eyes opened. Well, she said, that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was on a Friday. And I didn't, I don't work the weekends, so right. um, I didn't hear anything. I went back in on Monday, and I went up to the, the unit, and I said to the nurse on charge, <laughs> oh, I heard she had died on the oh, weekend. Okay. I got notification that she had died. Right. So I said to the nurse, so tell me about what happened. And the nurse said, well, you know, it was really strange. Um, she, she, uh, the nurse went in to check on her, and she was doing fine. She said she was okay, right. but she said, I think I'm going to go to sleep. And the oh, nurse wow. said, okay, well, you just close your eyes and go to sleep, and I'll come back in later. Wow. And the nurse came in an hour later, and she was dead. Wow. Yes. So yes. I can't help yeah. but imagine that she probably just thought, well, this time's for real. It's time. <laughs> yeah, it's time, right? But I'm it done. was quite a story. And I, don't ask me to explain it. Yeah, I can't explain yeah. any of it. But I, it's but just one of, of those things. A lot of times we can't when it comes to death. You know what, Ron? I, 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 the stories I could tell, yeah. and I have no explanation. I don't right. need to. Right. You know, they are. They are what yeah. they are. The second yeah. question I ask people is, um, what do you think happens after death? Mm. Not because I'm trying to you know, persuade them of anything. Right. I'm just interested in what they think happens after right, death. Right. I mean, some people will say to me, because, the, you know, hospice is not a, a Christian organization. Right. It doesn't have any religious right. connections. So I'm not working within a framework of that. Right. So I would hear everything. I would hear, yeah. most often I would hear, well, you know, I was raised in church, or I was raised a Catholic, or I was raised a United, or I was raised a Pentecostal, or... And, right. you know, I left the church a long time ago, but, uh, you know, I think, I think I still believe those things. Mm. You know, so people, you know, have, right. Go back to certainly the our age, we have yeah. that root in right. religion that, that kids probably don't have in the, right. this generation. So sometimes they'll revert to what they right. have heard. <clears throat> sometimes people will say, you know, I don't know. I hope, And then I'll follow it up with, what do you hope it is? Yes. You know, yeah. just so we can have yeah. that conversation. I like that yeah. So thank you again, and thank you for listening uh, to this session with us, and we will come back uh, with more from David.